history inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at how maritime rules have divided passengers based on their gender throughout the centuries. While some of the research had been challenging to find, it is interesting how segregation made it difficult for families and individuals when travelling by sea. Segregation in ships for thousands of years, maritime history has been the core centre of human interaction and the activity of the sea. It displays an interdisciplinary theme in terms of global travel. But what is overlooked is the history of sex segregation on board vessels and how it divided and tested passengers and crew at sea. Being on a ship, especially if you are travelling to a new world, could be dangerous, with passengers and crew members being victims of abuse, disease, injuries, the dangers at sea, and death. Although things have changed today, it isn't difficult to overlook sex segregation. How women, men, and families would have access to different parts of ships and sleep in separate cabins or bunk beds during voyages. How much medical attention was there, and repetitive questions on when passengers and crew would reach land without facing a disaster or succumb to an illness. Sex segregation had only occurred in third-class accommodations rather than second- or first-class accommodations. The reason why was because of either Victorian prudery or Victorian morality. Morality is a distillation of the moral views where people can judge humanistic actions, decisions and intentions, while prudery, particularly sexual prudery, focuses on the reactions to human behaviours. In other words, when you put two and two together, it is improper to break down the decorum or etiquette for controlling sexual behaviours. Those who break them by unleashing sexual hormones and acting sexual intercourse would be looked down on by society, especially women. Legislations were put in place to protect third-class passengers or steerage passengers and crew members. Shipping companies like Cunard and White Star had created policies promising their staff and customers that they would be protected from harm. When it came to living conditions and personal hygiene on board ships, third-class passengers would often be treated as though they were livestock. The first written record of sex segregation at sea comes from the voyage of the Mayflower, a merchant ship which had sailed on the transatlantic route in the 17th century. In England, people lived in religious turmoil, where there was a division between Catholics, Protestants and Puritans. Puritan separatists began to fear for their lives when it was clear that there was no hope for their future. The only option was to emigrate. 102 passengers and 37 crew members had signed onto the Mayflower to leave their lives in England to begin a new life in the United States of America. Passengers had to pay $6.07 for a ticket to board the ship. The journey between the two countries took 66 days. It was a rough journey, and life on board was unbearable. Crew members slept in the poop house, where people would go to the toilet. The passengers had to live below deck in crowded, cold and damp conditions. The passengers had shared and slept in the Mayflower's gun deck. The deck had no windows, and the passengers had to sleep on top of each other. If they wanted to have privacy, families had erected small wooden dividers and hanging curtains. If they wanted to go to the toilet, they would have to use a slop bucket. Both crew and passengers would suffer bouts of seasickness and would live on rations, eating hardtack biscuits and dried meat and drinking beer. Crime had occurred on the ship too. Some acts had led to pregnancy. At the time, there were no rules for single men and women. Despite this, all but one managed to reach Cape Cod successfully, and from there, they began their new lives. As the centuries continued, Merchant, cargo, or other kinds of ships started taking on more passengers who were wanting to start a new life in other homeland countries, like Australia or America. Passengers who were emigrating came from either Britain, Ireland, or Europe. This had become an available option for the poor who lived in huge families. This had become an available option for the poor who lived in huge families. By the early 20th century, it became fashionable for families to leave their native countries to start their lives in America. Even on school registers at the time, teachers would scratch out children's names writing that they had gone to America with their families. For more opportunities, passengers were introduced to passenger cruising services in Britain and cruise liner companies like Cunard, 
White Star and P&O began building ocean liners like the Clermont and the SS Britain. By the mid-19th century, there was increasing competition for companies. However, the living conditions hadn't improved, and that was where the class divisions came in. Third-class passengers and living conditions in the mid-1800s were similar to the conditions crew members and passengers had lived on the Mayflower. On board, the passengers were placed in cargo holds or inside the machinery spaces below a ship. Depending on where the passengers boarded, the passengers had little access. In some ships, they would have to climb down ladders and use passageways down the hatches if they wanted to get down to the between decks. Of course, this was for a cargo ship. To sleep, they shared bunk beds, intending to hold between three to six people, with straw mattresses and no bedding sheets available. Third-class passengers had to bring their bedding sheets and occasionally their food. Some contemporary sources report that lice and fleas thrived in these environments. According to an account by a commentator who was on board the northern German Lloyd Line ship SS Kaiser Wilhelm II, they described the living conditions on board. They are positively packed like cattle, making a walk on deck when the weather is good absolutely impossible, while to breathe clean air below in rough weather when the hatches are down is an equal impossibility. The stenches become unbearable, and the division between the sexes is not carefully looked after, and the young women who are quartered among the married passengers have neither the privacy to which they are entitled, nor are they much more protected than if they were living promiscuously. The food, which is miserable, is dealt out of huge kettles into the dinner pails provided by the steamship company. There were no reports on sex segregation around the mid-18th century, but an unknown source describes the passenger living quarters on the East Asiatic liner, the Lorvik. On the Lorvik, the arrangements on board were very primitive and inadequate. On the beams between decks was laid a deck of planks with hatchways down into the hold, where all the baggage was stowed away on top of the cargo. Two rows of bunks of rough boards were built up, one above the other, the whole length of the ship from fore to aft. Between these open bunks, there were often put up special berths reserved for emigrants whose demands were greater. Everything else was used in common, no separate rooms for men and women. Light was emitted through open hatchways and partly through skylights in the deck. There was canvas in the hatchways, but during storms and rough seas, these often had to be covered, and if this continued for any length of time, the air in the room below occupied by the emigrants often became frightfully bad. By the late 19th century, the British shipping line, the White Star Line, decided to make changes to their liners to ensure that their passengers would be comfortable and safe. Creating policies to ensure the protection of passengers, the company decided to design cabins, make more space, and provide public rooms for third class. With the creation of the Big Four, the RMS Adriatic, Baltic, Cedric and Celtic, White Star provided more comfort and more space for their passengers. The entrances had been included to replace hatchways and have large spaces underneath the ships. Unlike the ships before the Big Four, White Star had designed three separate compartments for different passenger categories. For example, on the Adriatic, the ship had a front compartment for single men and a middle compartment for married couples and families. Single women had been given private cabins of their own further aft. Although there were separate cabins, passengers had to share a dining saloon during mealtimes. On the Arabic, accommodations were upgraded by having separate entrances for all compartments, including having their toilets and a hospital. In between the men and married people and family accommodations, the ship had a saloon. In the single women's compartments, they had qualified surgeons. However, White Star Line still enforced harsh rules, like passengers having to be placed down below decks if a passenger is seasick, following a strict timetable, and cleaning all plates, cups, and cutlery instead of the stewards. Also, the segregation and policies didn't protect women from sexual harassment and abuse. There were accounts of passengers who didn't like to follow the rules and cause regular disruption. By the turn of the 20th century, accommodations for third class had improved on all ocean liners. Many liners had promoted their ships to their customers, hoping to attract them to travel on their ships while promising them faster journeys, comfort and luxury. The most detailed example of third-class passengers and their lives on board an ocean liner came from eyewitness accounts and informational resources on the infamous White Star Liner, the RMS Titanic. Life on board during the ship's maiden voyage for third-class passengers was lively, and survivors of the disaster had given accounts describing how grand the Olympic class liner was. One source about life in the third class comes from the story of a young Irish couple. 
third-class passengers Dennis Lennon and school student Mary Mullen had decided to elope and start a new life in America. Although Mary came from a wealthy family, she and the penniless Dennis got the train to Queenstown, where they boarded the Titanic on 11th April 1912. Through their eyes, we can imagine what they did during the maiden voyage like the rest of the third-class passengers. Before boarding the Titanic, they were supposed to board another White Star vessel, but they transferred to the Titanic due to a coal strike in Southampton. Whether he had to pay again for the tickets or not, a price for a third-class ticket would cost between three and eight pounds, which would cost between 267 to 704 US dollars today. Dennis and Mary boarded the Titanic as brother and sister, with Mary using Dennis's surname. When they arrived at the docks, both Dennis and Mary would have waited by the dockside to be examined by doctors in case they brought lice, disease, etc. If they did, they wouldn't be allowed on board. Third-class cabins were located on the ship's F and G decks, and there were two entrances. Women and families would have entered the Titanic from the main stairwell located at C deck, while men had to enter the ship via Scotland Road. When on board, single women and families were assigned to the stern to find their cabins, while single men's cabins were at the bow. In each cabin, there were bunk beds, which would accommodate up to four people. Inside cabins, there were wash basins and curtains. There were two downsides to it. In some cabins, passengers who slept on the lower decks would have heard noises and felt the vibrations of the engines. There had been two toilets and showers for each section of the ship available for all the passengers. Some rooms had segregation rules, including the smoking room, which was only for men, and the dining saloon, in which the room had to be separated by a bulkhead. However, open space allowed both sexes to interact with each other. In the open space, passengers would use it for musical entertainment and socialization. In addition, there were outdoor spaces on the poop and afwell decks. However, some third-class passengers broke the rules as single men and women might have mixed cabins and got up to mischief. Like Dennis and Mary, there have been single men and single women pretending to be related or who pretended to be married. Dennis and Mary were allowed to have nearby cabins at the ship's stern because they were family members. Four days into her maiden voyage, the Titanic struck an iceberg and sank on the 15th of April 1912. Out of the 706 third-class passengers on board, only 174 had survived. Dennis and Mary did not survive the sinking. The last ship to have third-class accommodations was the Cunard liner RMS Queen Mary. Constructed in 1930, the RMS Queen Mary gave third-class rooms and accommodations were extended from the main deck down to E deck. In the rooms, third-class passengers on board had various luxuries. These included a barber shop, a children's playroom, a garden lounge, and a cinema. However, third-class accommodations did not last long. After the Second World War, third-class on the Queen Mary changed to tourist class. In 1964, the US government passed the Civil Rights Act, which ended sex segregation in schools, work organizations, and on ocean liners. This meant that single men and women were allowed to share cabins like married couples and families. Four years later, RMS Queen Mary retired from service with the Cunard Line, and today she's permanently moored as a tourist attraction at Long Beach, California. When she had retired, all third-class accommodations had been removed as the cabins were unsuitable for use. Today, there are no sex segregation rules on ocean liners that are in force. It's hard to believe that centuries ago, it was seen as inappropriate for men and women to mix with married couples and families. Sex segregation isn't seen as discrimination for centuries, and it was standard practice for single men and women to be separated. Today, we see the opposite. However, sex segregation and third-class passengers on ships and ocean liners have changed maritime history, mainly the sinking of the Titanic. Both class and sex segregation had seen many passengers travelling to the new world and how ocean liners have transformed today. I would like to thank Erin of Airy Berry True Crime for being our guest host and joining us on the voyage. 
on her channel, Erin's content focuses on crime and solving mysteries. If you are into crime and mystery, head on to Erin's channel and subscribe for future videos. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please subscribe for more historical content. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the docks. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.